Welcome to the Gen Z Show. I'm your host, James McLam, and I welcome you today to the program. I'm joined again this week by two beautiful young ladies from Texas, Brianna and Bailey Chavez. How are you ladies doing today? Doing really good. I'm really excited to be here, and I really enjoyed our conversation with Miss Stevens. It was very empowering to me. Yes, I also learned a lot, and I'm super excited for everyone else to listen to it. Listen, this was one that the more, the longer that we were in this call, the more excited that I got about the things that I was learning. You know, a lot of times when I'm interviewing people, I, I get, I always gain something from the interviews. I even learn something. But this was one of those times where it was like a information dump on me. And it was like, wow, I, I, I could not take notes enough on this. Because what the issue that we're dealing with today is about body image and how that translates sometimes into eating disorders or disordered eating. As we learn, there is a difference in those today. And our guest is Dr. Lauren Stevens from Clemson University, where she is a professor in the Youth Development Leadership Program at Clemson, where she's working primarily with undergrads in the minors, those who want to minor in youth development leadership. She works predominantly with them. I got to meet her through a cohort in that program, in the YDL program that I'm involved with at Clemson. And I noticed that her uh, research was on this particular area, on body image and eating disorders. And I really wanted to bring her in. What are some of the takeaways from our time together that you ladies had? So like you touched on, uh, I really learned that there's a difference between like an eating disorder and then disordered eating. An eating disorder is, has been like clinically diagnosed. Um, and then disordered eating is just like behaviors and habits that are being developed that are not very healthy regarding eating. Yeah. And then as far as my takeaway, I just really thought it was inspiring how she kind of used her uh, experience with disordered eating in college to kind of translate into her career now. Um, we've kind of experienced that we've gone through an eating disorder when we were younger, um, and it's helped us decide what career we want to do in the future. So I just thought that was super inspiring and interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of information. And parents, you're, you're going to want to take notes on this as well. Maybe bookmark this so you can come back and review this particular episode, uh, share it with some folks. And one of the things I want to point out is we always put good information in the show notes. But today, if you'll go down to the show notes, you'll find a link uh, that you can opt into that will have the opportunity for you to get a list of all some information on podcasts, some information on some websites, some resources. If you are struggling with these particular issues, or you know someone who may be struggling with this. And we want to help and provide the resources. We are not experts on this, but this is someone who has done a great deal of research on this and is able to provide you this time. So I want us to just jump right into this very strong and powerful interview uh, about this particular subject with Dr. Lauren Stevens. So let's go straight to the show. Dr. Stevens, welcome to the Gen Z Show. Thank you uh, for agreeing to be our guest today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, when as, uh, as we were talking in the pre-call, when you were introduced to the Clemson cohort for youth, leadership, youth development leadership that I, uh, I'm a part of, and I started Googling and I saw what your research focus was, I really wanted to get you in this because I'm very, very interested, first off, you know, self-image is one of the three areas that we focus on in uh, Generation Ziegler, but you've narrowed it down to body image and how that's affecting eating disorders. How, how did you, well, before we do that, before I ask you that, how about introducing yourself to the audience so they can hear from you a little bit about yourself? Sure, thanks. So I'm Lauren Stevens. I'm a faculty member at Clemson University in the Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Department, where I primarily teach within the Youth Development Leadership Undergraduate Minor Program. Um, working with adolescents and young adults is my spark, and I'm so grateful for a job that lets me uh, do this day in and day out. Um, the young people that I work with want to also work with youth. Um, they themselves are still in the later years of, of this youth time. And so they inspire me daily. And I hope that's something that never changes. Um, and then my research, as you mentioned already, explores the ways um, that contextual 
school factors. So things like relationships or social media um, influence student athletes or youth's perceptions of body image and eating behaviors um, and related symptoms. And then more broadly, I'm involved in several projects that look at youth mental health um, and positive youth development through contexts such as sports or nature and those types of things. So what was it about body image, specifically eating disorders as well, that motivated you to want to do an extensive amount of research on this? Yeah, so the inspiration for my research line comes from a, a fairly personal place. Um, as I developed an eating disorder in college where I was a student athlete and spent the better part of the past decade kind of working through the recovery process. And so in some ways, that's uh, the personal connection is an asset, right? It motivates me to look at the topic in new ways um, with a passion that might otherwise kind of wane in the research world. Um, it also makes me empathetic for the youth you know, that I'm working with or that our studies kind of connect with. Uh, as a researcher though, it's also important for me to be aware of some of the biases that I bring with me into studies because of that experience, right? And so um, you know, taking measures to account for and kind of protect against those biases are important um, so that I don't see things in the research that aren't there or conversely might miss things that I, I could be blinded to based on, you know, what I already think or, or that kind of thing in a situation. So we might have parents, uh, even some students that, that are watching this, who maybe have a different definition or a different perception of what exactly we're talking about here. When we're talking about body image and eating disorders, could you explain to them what the problem is, what the issue is? you know, so that, you know, just kind of lay it out there so that they can see this is where you're coming from. And this is kind of build the foundation for the rest of our time. Sure. So I think it's important to, to like, as you're saying, clarify kind of what we mean by each, right? Body image is really um, your self-perception of yourself, right? How you view yourself, um, the way you kind of feel in your body, the way that you're aware of your movements or those kind of things. Um, and everyone has, a body image, right? We have a way we view ourselves. Um, some of us may view our bodies really positively. Some may view them more negatively. Some may have just kind of a body neutrality or kind of acceptance, right? Like this is who I am. I don't think about it a lot. Other people may think about it more, right? And so everyone has body image. Then there's disordered eating and eating disorders. And I do want to distinguish between the two, just again, as we're talking here, so that others are kind of aware. Um, Eating disorders are clinically diagnosed um, mental health conditions. And so there are um, certain criteria in the uh, DSM-5 is the version we're up to that you, you meet these criteria or you don't and you're diagnosed with a specific eating disorder. Um, disordered eating really refers to, it's, it's not clinically um, you know, diagnose. There are no clinical criteria for this, but it still kind of encapsulates this, uh, these unhealthy behaviors around food or these um, apprehensions around food or, um, or eating in general, right? So this could be only eating certain food groups or considering uh, some foods healthier than others. And then, you know, trying to exercise or, or make up for the things that you've eaten because you feel guilty for them or shame for them or those kind of things, right? So you can have disordered eating or, or demonstrate disordered eating behaviors without having a clinically diagnosed eating disorder as well. So I'm not a, a clinical psychologist. I don't diagnose anyone with eating disorders. And when I'm researching, it's important for me and the, the measures that we use and, and the youth that I work with to distinguish between kind of those two groups in particular um, because of what my credentials are or are not. Hmm. What, what is, how prevalent is, is this problem among youth? Uh, let's just, just, just take for example, the high school group. I know that the numbers probably are very dynamic and they change quite a bit, but you know, what, what is, how prevalent is it? Yeah, so we know that over um, the, their lifetime, it's estimated that more than 20 million women and 10 million men in America will have an eating disorder at some point in their life. Now, again, there are many types of eating disorders. Um, and so when you get down into some of those um, differences or those disorders, uh, the numbers vary, right? But we do have some fairly... Um, I don't know, some, some statistics that are, are concerning, right? We know that as young as 
uh, kids as young as six kind of are wow. aware of and are thinking about what uh, their body looks like, like they, they're afraid of being fat, right? We have studies that, that show that. Um, we also know that 40 to 60% of elementary school age girls um, are thinking about these things. They voice concerns about, about being fat. Half of teen girls and a third of uh, teen boys use unhealthy um, weight control behaviors or, or demonstrate disordered eating behaviors of some sort. And so these are all, all things to be aware of, um, particularly when we're working with youth and, and vulnerable populations. So now I've heard a parent that's been watching this and they're looking at this and they're getting, they're freaking out. They're like half to a third. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, how can I help? So what are some of the causes of that, that lead to these types of issues uh, that they can be maybe even, or even some signs that they can be on the lookout for? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> there are, so eating disorders are not attributed to like any one specific factor, right? What we're finding and the kind of the consensus in the research is that it's a combination of uh, biological, psychological, sociocultural factors, right? Um, it can, you know, biological factors um, would include things like your genetics or do you have family members with a history of an eating disorder? Um, psychological types of factors might include things like um, you, uh, anxiety or depression or perfectionism or you know some of those characteristics that might be more inherent to who you are or, or general tendencies that you may have. And then sociocultural factors, well, social media, um, the, the ideas that we see on pushed forth on, on things like Instagram or on TikTok, that's a, a big sociocultural factor. Um, depending on, you know, who you consider yourself to be, your identity. Are you an athlete? Are you part of the LGBTQ community, right? So there's other um, kind of identity pieces that also may put you at a heightened risk for developing um, an eating disorder as opposed to someone in maybe more of the general population. Mm. Uh, Brandon, was it you that was talking to me before the call about social media? Yes. So I've been like listening and thinking, uh, I like how you said that there's a difference between like an eating disorder and disordered eating because like we weren't like clinically diagnosed with the eating disorder. So now I know that there's a difference. So that was something that I learned. Um, and just like reflecting on like what may have like caused it, even though you said like not one thing causes it. So for us, I really don't think it was social media because we didn't have a lot of social media platforms back then, but we are like huge perfectionists and like have anxiety and things like that. So I think that was mainly a cause of it. But touching on the social media thing, how do you think like social media affects body image and like what ways should we be aware of like how social media affects body image? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, Brianna. Um, I think part of social media, and we talk about this in some of the courses that I teach, um, is really trying to remind our youth that social media shows a snapshot of someone's life and it's often a very edited or the very, you know, the most exciting or the most presentable part of someone's life, right? Um, there are, you know, we see these pictures or we see these, these TikTok videos that are like, look at what I'm doing. And, and sometimes that makes people who aren't included feel alone, or maybe it makes someone who has a, a very different body type or body shape feel like, oh, well, I don't look like them. Like something must be wrong with me. And so I think um, our youth and, and society, but you know, we're talking kind of youth adolescents here, right? Um, so much of their, their life is spent with technology or social media around them, right? Y'all have grown up with it almost at your fingertips for, for much of your life. And so uh, kind of trying to keep that in perspective, I think is something that's important. Uh, you know, there's also some movements on social media, like uh, body positivity or body acceptance. And so uh, there are things I think can be positive, right? There's some movements, um, I think Dove and Airy are two companies that are really using this unfiltered kind of approach they're using. Um, I think airy real is maybe the, the slogan that they use, but unedited pictures of models of all different sizes and all different shapes and all different, you know, a, a ability levels as well, right? And so things like that, I think are really positive and are, are hopefully going to continue trending as they are. Um, so, you know, I think those are some things that, that 
could be helpful. And then also some things kind of to watch out for when we're on social media. As to your point, one other thing that can be helpful is curating your feed, right? That was something that was important for me um, as I was working through kind of the recovery processes. If I'm viewing pictures or I'm viewing accounts that are encouraging some of these disordered behaviors, I probably need to unfollow that person or that account um, and instead find accounts that are promoting the values that I want to align myself with or that are um, promoting behaviors that are healthy, right, and that are helpful. And so um, there are some really great Instagram accounts and, uh, you know, counselors and resources out there. And so part of it is finding those and making sure that you're surrounding yourself in your corner of the internet with those things that are helpful for you. Yeah, that was very informative. Um, one question that I have for you is just so like whenever we struggled with our eating disorder, um, we did go to a doctor because I actually uh, had a stress fracture from it because I was like under eating and over exercising. Um, but I didn't really know where to go to find resources to kind of help the mental aspect of that. So I was just wondering if you had any recommendations for people who are struggling with disordered eating. Yeah, so great question, Bailey. Um, I think there are a lot of resources on the internet that can be helpful. Um, so the NIDA website, the National Eating Disorder Association website has a lot of resources. It has some screening tools. It has information, like statistics. It has, uh, how do you support loved ones with an eating disorder? All of those kind of things. I think that can be helpful. Um, as I mentioned, there's also, you know, while we know there are negative and, and kind of and helpful things on social media, there are also some really positive things, right? And so some of my favorite accounts to follow like to this day are um, Jennifer Rollins. She's a psychologist in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And she puts out fantastic content, um, you know, with disclaimers that she's not offering therapeutic advice over social media. She can't do that unless you're her client, but the things that she's putting forth are still from a, a haze, a health at every size kind of perspective or, or you know, positive body image kind of things. Um, there are some dietitians on um, the Instagram as well. So Anna Sweeney, um, her Instagram handle is dietitian Anna, is one of my favorite dietitians to follow. Again, kind of this all foods fit approach, like you are more than what your body looks like. Um, it, so there's some really helpful resources there as well. Um, and I think part of it is finding one or two that you really resonate with and then looking to see who else follows them or who do they follow. And that's kind of how I've tracked down and kind of curated my feed a bit to where it's a more positive space when I do spend time on social media. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think that whenever I kind of struggled with it, I think I kind of more focused on the physical aspect, but it's really a me mental thing as well. So I think that would be helpful to a lot of people to kind of look to those resources instead of just foc focusing completely on the physical aspect. Well, and I think, you know, that's a great point too, right? So often we see eating disorders manifested in a physical way, um, but I think something Maybe it's a, a myth is that it's that it's this choice, right? That it's something everyone, these, these people are choosing to do. And that's that's just not true. Um, it's very much a, a brain kind of condition or there's a lot of links there. Um, and so part of, I think, recovery, the recovery process and support for those in eating disorder recovery is to recognize that there's a difference between who that person is as a person and kind of this eating disorder brain recognizing that they're, they're two different things, right? And so um, if we're going to treat an eating disorder, we're going to encourage the recovery process, we need to be aware that it's not, there are physical manifestations, right? But that's not how we feel fix or we address the root of the problem, right? It is kind of this mental or emotional condition that also um, needs attention. So you said you, you uh, Dr. Stevens, that you had your experience, was it in college with this or high school? It was in college. College, in college and you were a college athlete and, and it was as a result of that? Yeah, you do. Know, I'm not sure that I would say strictly as a result of that, right? I think there are a lot of factors at the time. Um, I was a, a college athlete. I ran cross country um, at my university. Um, but there is also, it was toward the end of my college career. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. Was I going to have a job? Um, my, there's some 
you know, changes in my family happening, right? There are all these things happening. And I think what we see a lot of times in, in eating disorders or disordered eating behaviors is looking for kind of the sense of control or feeling like mm -hmm. everything's not quite as out of control as maybe it might feel. And so what you find when you're in it, it often is that you're really still not in control of what you think you are. Um, it kind of gets out of hand sometimes, but I think trying to regain a sense of feeling like, uh, you know, that I had some control or I knew what I was doing. Like, I think those are some things that in my experience factored in, but I think are also fairly common across the spectrum of, of eating disorder experiences. This experience for you two ladies actually has helped dictate what you wanted to major in in college, correct? Yes. So whenever we first started having like our eating disorder uh, issues and stuff, we were in about seventh or eighth grade. And around that time, we were also in our health class and um, they had a health class offered in the junior high. So that kind of, uh, I would say it kind of like altered our way of thinking a little bit, just because that's where we got like the idea, like to eat healthy and stuff, but also we were involved in like athletics and stuff. And so we started eating healthy kind of uh, to ha help us perform better in those things. Um, and then that did lead to the eating disorder and everything like that. But whenever we got into high school, we um, started researching nutrition a little bit more. So now we kind of, we do agri-science fair projects over nutrition, and that's definitely helped our eating disorder and just found, we found that we could like pursue a career in that field. Um, and so, like you said, although it was a huge struggle for many years, it's also been an asset just because we know what we want to do and we'll be able to be more empathetic to our clients when we get older. That's an awesome perspective. Yeah. You see, you see why I don't do these interviews by myself. <laughs> see how boring it would be and how less informative it would be if it was just me talking. I mean, I'm, I would ask all these parent <laughs> questions from a parent perspective. Maybe I mean, I've got three children myself, so that, that's something that's, that I would be concerned with. But what? Yeah, I don't, I don't know which way the camera is going to be pointed. So whichever way they are in the camera. <laughs> <laughs> we know how to end up on the screen you know that's why that's why we do this so that we can have someone uh, with more perspective and much more intelligent than I am <laughs> smarter than I am on this so as a parent parents will listen to this they they're, they're hearing you say okay there's not really a, a true you know one real cause it can be a variety of different things but what how can they identify some potential signs or maybe some warning even some warning signs you know, of, hey, maybe this is something we need to address. What is the research showing or some of the warning signs or some of the things that you've seen during your, um, your time studying this? Sure. So I think um, one thing to look out for is if there are sudden changes in your child's behavior, right? Are there suddenly certain foods that they're avoiding or are they suddenly declining dinner, they're not hungry, right? I'm not hungry, I already ate, right? Things and changes in behavior would be would be one of those things. Um, I think it, it's important for talking eating disorders or mental health in general, if, if your child seems to be in distress or there's stress at school or there are concerns with, you know, friends or those kind of things to, to be checking in with your child in general, right? And so being aware of some of those kind of factors might also be important, right? Are there stressors, again, for children at school with friends and sports, um, maybe in the family, there are sources of, of stress and just kind of to be on the lookout for those. Um, I think my advice to parents would be to try to keep as kind of neutral of a view on food as possible, right? Like let's not classify some foods as good foods and bad foods um, or healthy foods or junk foods even, right? Let's, food is uh, energy, it's important for you to be able to run and to play with your friends and, um, you know, engage in theater or music or whatever it is that your passion is. And so to, to view it much less as, as like a, a moral kind of decision and, and more simply as, as just food, as energy, right? So the approach that we take as the adults, whether it's a parent or a mentor uh, or a coach or a role model, I think, um, our youth are, are watching, our children are watching. And so they're going to pick up uh, views or, or thoughts about food and many other things, right? Based on the way that we approach those as well. Mm. How do friends influence uh, the possibility of, of, of youth getting into eating disorders or disordered eating? Yeah, so um, 
I guess I'll speak to this in, in two ways. So the first is we know that um, in childhood and adolescence, um, peers are friends are a really important uh, source of support for our youth, right? Um, particularly for children who are in school, elementary, middle, high school, you spend a lot of time around your friends. Um, and so you often will model or adapt behaviors that they do. And so just as with your parents or other important adults, uh, children may model or take after or uh, kind of pick up some of those thoughts or attitudes related to food, right? So they certainly do have an impact. Um, in some of my research with collegiate student athletes, what I found um, and what the, the student athletes reported was that their friend groups um, did have an influence, but it was often in kind of a, a more positive way, right? They found support from their friends. And maybe that's unique to kind of this team situation. They spent and all this time together, right? Um, their success as a team is often kind of dependent on what each other person is doing. And so- They're on the same journey together. They encounter the same struggles, so they probably understand it better. Right, and so it was uh, almost for them, kind of like there's a sense of camaraderie, right? They were aware, I felt comfortable kind of sharing those struggles, mm. but then also were pretty supportive and able to, encourage um, each other kind of through some of those times and in some of the negative body image or trying to look like the ideal athlete kind of things that might otherwise fuel some of these disordered eating behaviors. Um, what question, one question that I thought of, so like what would, so you, like he's talking from like the parent's perspective, but like what would be some advice for like the child that's like starting to like notice like that they're having struggles with body image and disordered eating? Yeah. So your question is, what would you like, encourage the child to do? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, for both the child and maybe even an older, an older adolescent, right? Finding a person that you feel comfortable talking to or sharing that with is really important, right? As a youth worker, I would hope that every youth has that person. Maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a teacher or a guidance counselor or a coach or a friend, right? It could be a, a peer, a friend, um, and voicing, hey, I think something's not right. Even if you don't know what exactly it is, um, being willing to be vulnerable about that and to be real in that safe place with that safe person, I think is really important. And so that would be my kind of my first piece of encouragement. Um, I think from there, there's other things that you can do, right? Um, if social media or the things that you're watching or the things that you're reading are a problem, well, let's kind of modify what we're spending our time with. Um, if the activities that we're engaging in are encouraging some of these behaviors, we don't need to stop them completely, but can we modify them again in a way that's going to be more beneficial? Um, you know, for children, particularly parents are still often uh, in a place of authority. And so there is a little bit of help there, right? There can be contracts or, or, you know, kind of, I don't want to call them rules, but, but maybe rules, right? You know, if you want to be able to go and practice, you're going to have to make sure that you fueled your body well first. Those kinds of things um, can be important. And so I think it's huge that a youth would feel for them to recognize, right, that something feels off and for them to want to help, uh, want the help in, in the first place, I think is a really, that's a, a huge step and a huge win, and you know, right there. Um, if the youth didn't feel comfortable going to someone with it, um, again, there are, you know, kind of screening tools or helplines or those kind of things available through NIDA or the Eating Recovery Center or places like that. And so that would also be a, a place that, that they could explore and reach out um, and maybe talk to someone a little bit more anonymously, but still kind of get help and maybe get pointed in, in a different direction for more support. I'm writing these stuff down in my notebook. By the way, my notebook. You see where I'm going? Go Tigers. Go Tigers. <laughs> I did use the, I was using the Clemson pen, but it, it broke. So. Um, I actually have another question for you. Um, so can you tell us a little bit just about like your college experience and how you got to where you are today? I'm interested since we're going to be going into nutrition, body image, that kind of stuff. Sure. So um, when I entered college, I was not real sure what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to work with youth um, and I wasn't quite sure what that looked like, but I ended up in the education 
program. Um, I thought I would be a teacher. My mom's a teacher. Uh, she's a rock star teacher. And so um, I thought that's working with youth every day. And so that was a program um, that I followed. I uh, was not originally a student athlete during college. Um, I was asked to, to join the cross country team uh, because they needed an additional runner to be able to place at events. And I had participated in sports all through middle and high school. And so I mean, it was a steep learning curve, but it was an experience and opportunity I was really grateful for, um, pushed me in, in a lot of ways. After college, I taught middle and high school for a year and a half. So really got some hands-on experience with youth. Um, I did some coaching, like athletic sports kind of coaching with youth, um, worked in some youth development programs like Young Life um, or ministries kind of through some local churches here in South Carolina, and then went back to school, um, grad school at the University of Oklahoma first, and then came to Clemson um, to work with one of my now colleagues on youth development research, right? I, again, knew that I still wanted to be involved with youth, but had really developed a passion for uh, older youth, high school, college age. It's a really kind of interesting time of trying to figure out who you are and uh, who you want to be and what you want your impact on the world to be and, and those kind of things. And um, my research lets me do that. My teaching here lets me do that. Um, and, and so I can't imagine doing anything other than what I'm doing right now um, and getting to, to, to interact with students here, getting to be parts of things like this with uh, high school, well, graduated high school maybe now, headed to college students. Um, I just, there's, I see so much potential in, in all of you in this generation um, and it's inspiring and I just wanna be a little part of it um, as you kind of figure out what your impact is gonna be. Yeah, that's super cool. I especially like how you like mentioned like your journey wasn't necessarily like completely linear, but you just like went back, you went back to college. Um, so you, even though you didn't start out in what you are now, um, I think that's very like inspiring for young people because we all think we have to have it figured out like as soon as you go to college, but that's definitely not the case. It was not the case for me. That is for sure. Yeah. There was one part of, of your research when I was reading through it that really spoke to me. And it's the section where you talk about that words have the power to heal or destroy. I just love that. I mean, it, that's just a, okay. Every week I try to tell folks to have something that we hashtag. This is the hashtag, you know, words have the power to heal or destroy. Could you just elaborate on that section and share with that really what it is? Because my experience of working with you and, and we just interviewed someone this week too. Uh, that whose podcast was the week before this one is that was dealing with bullying and and so this is a theme it seems that I'm having this week that that is the words that are they're having the power so if you wouldn't mind just just jumping on that one sure so um what I skipped over a minute ago with the question is when I went back to grad school um, I went back to school for professional writing I wanted to write a book and so for me words are really important just in general, right? We have the ability with our words to build someone up, to make them smile, to give them the compliment that they may not have had. Uh, but conversely, our words have the ability to totally destroy someone's self-confidence or to make them question who they are, what they're doing. And so I think we often just don't think about the power that our words really do have. Um, particularly in that section that you're referencing, James, um, what we found in uh, the study that we conducted is that the things that coaches or other athletes or parents or friends were saying were things that those interviewed and surveyed remembered, right? Mm -hmm. So a coach who said, you know, it's okay to go, we have this great place called Spill the Beans. It's ice cream here in Clemson, so good. But so a coach who said, you know, like it's cool to go get ice cream once a week or something, but you don't need to go three or four times. It wasn't even a direct, a, a, not attack, but it wasn't directly, you know, saying, oh, well, you're not a good athlete or anything like that. But those words and kind of the idea behind them, the implications of them um, made an 
impact on the student athletes, right? So when they were deciding, huh, what are we going to do today? Or what am I going to eat? They had those coaches words in the back of their head, probably shouldn't get ice cream because I already had ice cream like two days ago, right? Things like that. Uh, at the same time, though, words have the power to build someone up, right? So um, we kind of touched on this already, but the student athletes found a lot of support from their teammates, kind of this shared experience. We're all going through the same thing together um, after, you know, a, a rough game or something like that, having those people around you to build you back up and say, yeah, you didn't block the goal for like the game winning, you know, game winning situation, in the soccer game, but like, that's not who you are. Yeah. You missed it. Not a big deal. Your identity and your worth is, is so much bigger than that. Uh, that can totally, that's a totally different perspective and a totally different uh, kind of image builder than if you'd said, yeah, wait to like lose the game, right? Like, so the things that we say and the ways that we talk to people um, matter is really what that section of the research was getting at and is what we saw, right? We saw that these things matter. They, it wasn't it wasn't profound monologues or soliloquies. It was often just the comments that were made in passing, right? The everyday life words that we share with each other really do matter. Um, and so that was kind of one of the implications that came out of the study is just to, for all of us, um, for those student athletes and, and the support staff around them to think about and be mindful of the things that we're saying to other people uh, and the things that we're saying to ourselves as well can be really mm. important. Self-talk, so important. A lot of the things that you're talking about, we do, we cover in our self-image thing, which makes me so happy because we created this six, seven years ago. I mean, we've revised it some, but it was really from our own experiences that we created this curriculum and some, some experiences of some uh, college students at the time that helped write us write that curriculum. And so it's, it's wonderful for me to be on this side of it and be able to see, hey, there is research that backs up what we uh, actually uh, were doing way back then. It's kind of, when we were talking about when we were talking about words having the power and you gave that example, it, it reminded me of, of do the do you do, or people in general, are they interpreting what is being said through their personality type? And I, I kept thinking, I wonder if there's a if there's ever been any research done where it examines how that affects people based on a personality type. I, I'm a disc person. And when you said it, I immediately, because I'm a high D, which is a bottom line type of personality, I read it as being, okay, I can have it one type of week, not a big deal. But I could see where someone who is a S, which is more concerned about harmony and stuff, seeing it in a much different aspect. Person that's an I, which has a very uh, fun loving party personality, you're saying, oh, I get to have ice cream once a week, you know, and, and a C looking at it being very analytical. What does that mean? I can't have it any other time. So I, I don't know if there is that, but it just, that just kind of came to mind. I thought I'd share that free tidbit for the audience has nothing to do, but I don't know. Is, is Am I going off crazy or is that, is there anything out there like that? Well, I think you're hitting on a really important point, right? When we, when we say words, we know what we maybe mean by them, um, but we don't always know how they're going to be received or perceived. And I think maybe that's the caution, right? Is to be just thoughtful in the things that we say, um, to be aware, you know, to, to communicate as clearly as possible what we're saying uh, and to decide if it's really important to say, right? Like, is it gonna, mm -hmm. does it really matter? Does it need to be said? Um, as far as personalities and interpreting, I think you're, you're spot on, right? We know that um, if we all listen to the same comment or, uh, you know, exhortation or encouragement or student feedback, we're probably all going to interpret it differently based on our lived experience, based on um, how closely we tie our sense of self-worth to those things, um, based on our personalities in general. Um, and so, yes, I think that's certainly a, a thing as well. Um, and in, in terms of student athletes, we know that a lot of the things that make them good student athletes, right? Things like perfectionism and following rules and, um, you know, working hard, like determination, perseverance, all of these things that make you a good student athlete also can be risk factors for eating disorders or disordered eating. And so mm. it just kind of, there's, 
it confounds the situation and makes it a little bit more, a little murky, right? Yeah, I can definitely like relate to what you are saying because when like what kind of like started a lot of our like with the way we thought about eating so we wanted to make cheerleader really bad and we we're like in seventh or eighth grade and we're those type of people that like kind of tie our self-worth to like what we accomplished and stuff which is not necessarily a good thing but that's just how we are um and my cheer coach she had told us like at our little meeting that we had that we would have practice every day after school and that if like in order to do our best at practice and stuff we need to like be drinking water um eat healthy, things like that. And so me and Bailey took that, like we're huge perfectionists. We like, we're, and we're very coachable. People have told us we try to like, we're very coachable. Um, <laughs> and so we took that, we are like, oh my goodness, we need to only eat healthy food. Like if we want to make cheerleader and we want to be the best cheerleaders that we can be, we need to do this. And so we started making switches from like, we just cut out all unhealthy food. We're like very extreme about it so definitely and she didn't mean it in like any type of way like that would be negative that's just how we took it and obviously the other cheerleaders did not take it that way so but that definitely I can see the research and like what you're talking about yes for sure yeah that's a, a perfect example right the the thing that the coach is saying is in try, trying to include or encourage you know eating in a way or or moving in a way that is going to make you a a better cheerleader or, you know, good at your sport or good at what you do. Um, and then the ways that it's heard or interpreted or acted upon is going to vary based on the personalities or yeah, by the individual, right. That's what we find a lot in, in any research that you do with human subjects, right. There's so, so many different individual factors that impact, um, <laughs> the findings that we get, but also the way people react in situations, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a huge topic, and, and obviously in our short time together, we're not going to be able to even touch it, uh, but if they wanted to find out more information, how could they get in touch with you so you can guide them or, or send them to, to some of these sites that you've uh, connected with? How can they connect with you, and where's the best place to connect with you at? Perfect. So um, I would love for any of you, all of you, anyone listening, um, Bailey, Brianna as well, to connect with me. The easiest way to do that is, is through email. Um, and so uh, my email is, it's kind of weird, but it's L-S-T-E-P-H, the number two, at clemson.edu. Um, I can send that to you, James. Maybe you have a way to put it up on the video. Yeah, we'll put it into show notes. We'll put it okay. in show notes. So I do know that the show notes are down. So if you look down and hit show more, you'll see the email address. So. Perfect. So that would be the easiest way um, to reach out with me. I'm happy to share any of the resources mentioned today, um, other resources, books that are great, um, podcasts that are helpful. Um, there's so many things out there. A lot of times it's just uh, finding what is most helpful and what truly comes from um, a, a good positive place, right? Not disguised as some kind of encouraging disordered behaviors, you know, disguised as healthy eating or those kinds of things. And anything girls that you got that you want to ask before we close out our time together? That's really all the questions that I had. Yeah, me too. But it's been really fun and I love all the things that I've like learned and like my eyes have been open to a lot of things. So thank you. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I was watching them. I was watching them. Like I'd see a couple of times their, their <laughs> head would go back. I was like, oh, that means that they're, they just got a point there that they're taking their notes on and, and so forth. Dr. Stevens, thank you. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, Generation Ziegler, we really, really do focus, you know, it's one of our foundational things is, is working with youth and helping them develop a healthy self-image. And this being a, such a significant portion of that, I feel like it's something that we have never really examined. We kind of do it from a broad standpoint, you know, of, of the how do you, you know, maintain a healthy self-image from a broad standpoint, but understanding there are so many factors and this being such a prevalent one. I want to thank you for your time uh, today. And, and I'm glad that, that we have been able to connect. This, this has been fun. Well, I just am so appreciative um, for you inviting me to the, the show. I'm so thankful, uh, Bailey, Brianna, for your time here, your questions, uh, for sharing your experience, right? That's how we all learn and, and grow. And so um, it's been just a fun time to connect with you all. And um, I do hope you and anyone else will reach out with um, questions or ideas or just to chat, right? It's what we're all here for. 
So Gen Z audience, all the show notes again are down below. Just click the button below where it says show more. You can see all the contacts um, and you can click to get additional information down there as well about what we have discussed today. Like, share and comment on this video. There's someone that you know that needs to hear this. Make sure that you share this with them. And again, we'll see you guys again next week.